Uh, I'm Shigeru Miyagawa from MIT and University of Tokyo. Uh, this is my 26th year at uh, MIT as a professor of linguistics. And uh, I also uh, hold a chair called uh, Kochi Manjiro, uh, professor of Japanese language and culture. So I'm in two places uh, at MIT. This is my 26th year, and uh, at MIT, um, when you serve for uh, 25 years, uh, you are said to be in the quarter century club, and they give you a rocking chair. <laughs> so I, I have one of these rocking chairs now in my house. It's quite beautiful. Uh, and it's very uh, comfortable. And so this is the reward for working for 25 years at MIT. A few other rewards, uh, but uh, uh, that was a free one that uh, I got. Okay. So uh, as, uh, as I was introduced, uh, I, I got into this uh, business of online education and all of that that, that uh, uh, connects to uh, when I served on a presidential committee back in the year 2000 at MIT. Uh, where we were asked to come up with a e-learning strategy for MIT. Uh, year 2000 was still dot-com era, and the assumption going in was that we would create MIT.com. Uh, and in fact, we had uh, 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 members of Booth, Ellen, and Hamilton, which is a top-tier consulting firm, uh, to help us to create a business model for MIT.com. But as we got into the discussion uh, two, three months uh, in, uh, we realized that this was not a good idea for MIT to do at that point, okay? uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one of which is that uh, we started to feel very strongly that teaching materials created by faculty at MIT uh, should not be turned into products to be sold. The teaching materials should be uh, for teaching and education and not for making money for the university. The university can make money some other ways, uh, but not by using teaching materials. And so uh, we said no to MIT.com, but we still had to propose a, an e-learning strategy for uh, MIT, and what we ended up doing was uh, um, literally, I mean, this is a flipped class, uh, literally flipping the idea, uh, putting it on its head, and said, unlike everyone else, let's, let's just give it away. Let's just give it away, okay? Open it up, uh, tell the world, just come in. We will let you have all of our teaching materials for free, uh, openly, and under Creative Commons license, which means you can download, you can copy, you can distribute, you can alter, you can incorporate it into your own teaching materials. Okay? Uh, and so uh, that's what we did in uh, 2000. And uh, today, we have 2,300 courses on MIT Open Courseware. Uh, that's virtually the entire uh, offering in the undergraduate and graduate uh, programs at MIT across all five schools at MIT. Okay? If you haven't seen OCW, just go to OCW, that's open courseware, ocw.mit.edu, uh, and you'll get to the, uh, the top page, and from there you can find something of uh, interest. Today, we get 1.6 million people not hit people accessing open courseware each month. Okay. It's one of the largest uh, online educational sites in the world. So I'm very, very proud of that. Okay. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, something related to uh, open courseware, but an extension of open courseware, uh, where we, uh, we created a MOOC called Visualizing Japan, uh, and uh, we did it with Harvard. And uh, it was, it was, and I'll tell you, uh, I'll show you about uh, what uh, that MOOC is like. But there was a real irony in that, uh, in that enterprise, and this is what I want to talk to you about today. The irony of it was that I discovered that this massive and wonderful open uh, education online MOOC that we created uh, turned out to be most effective in the physical classroom. I teach a residential class at MIT called Visualizing Japan. Right? I have been teaching it for 15 years with Professor John Dower, who's an eminent historian of modern Japan, Pulitzer Prize winning historian for uh, his book, uh, Embracing Defeat. 
uh, he won the Pulitzer Prize in 1999. He and I have been teaching this course uh, since uh, about uh, 2002. Uh, and uh, uh, he retired, and I have been teaching it on my own. Uh, but uh, in 2014, we created this MOOC called Visualizing Japan with John and with other people that I'll show you. And uh, uh, I, I started to use it in my classroom and just completely transformed the way I teach. Okay? So I like to tell you about that. Uh, but I'd like to begin, so uh, and it, it was such an exciting uh, news that MIT uh, wrote about it. Uh, you can see this article on MIT News about how uh, uh, our MOOC sees its greatest impact in the classroom at MIT. Okay? More and more, I'm interested in how we can use digital learning materials to transform residential education. Okay. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay. So um, the, uh, the era of open education began in uh, 2001 with MIT OpenCourseWare. And exactly 10 years later, uh, Stanford uh, put up uh, this uh, um, course on uh, introduction to AI, artificial intelligence, by two people who have been teaching this course for many years. But in 2001, uh, 2011, they said, we are offering this online, and uh, anyone can sign up for the course. And something like 190,000 people from 160 countries register for the course. Uh, and that was a real surprise. Uh, and they had to turn in homework every week. That had to be graded. It was uh, every week. Okay? Uh, and so I emailed them and said, how many TAs do you have? You know, she's like, no, they had one TA. Okay? This is AI. It's all machine graded. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, uh, that, that was uh, quite, a, uh, um, quite, quite a surprise. Both the announcement of OpenCourseWare in 2001 and uh, this uh, incredible phenomenon in 2011 made the front page of New York Times. So that was 2011, start of the MOOCs. And uh, today, um, you can see this uh, uh, incredible growth in the number of MOOCs. Uh, today, we have something like, uh, I think, uh, close to 7,000 MOOCs offered by, I don't know how many universities. I used to say 800 universities. But clearly, it's many more than that. Okay? Ah, and so uh, MOOCs are not going to go away. You know? Around this time, here, people kept saying, oh, it's just a, a fad. It's just a fad. You know, it'll go away. Yeah. Uh, but it's not going to go away. It's uh, getting bigger and stronger and, and more interesting. Yeah. Um, and MOOCs are offered by, uh, by several organizations. The two main ones are Coursera, started by a couple of Stanford people. Uh, and you can see Coursera has the largest number of uh, Institutions, 145, uh, courses, 1,700, and uh, registered uh, users, 23, um, uh, 23 million people. That's followed by edX, started by uh, Harvard and MIT. Uh, 110 institutions, 1,300 courses, 10 million people. Uh, Future Learn is a, uh, a UK effort, and that's starting to come up. Uh, Udacity is also a Stanford. Uh, and Xue uh, Tang is a, uh, um, a Tsinghua University, uh, mainland Tsinghua University effort. Okay? So uh, these together, today, today, almost 50 million MOOC learners are registered to study with, uh, with a MOOC. Okay? So it's not going to go away. 50 million, that's a huge number. Okay? Uh, and it keeps growing uh, each day. One of the interesting trends uh, I noticed uh, just recently is that if you look at uh, the world ranking, Times World Ranking, number one, University of Oxford, uh, down to 25, uh, London School of Economics, that these, the most elite institutions are very heavily engaged in MOOC, uh, offering MOOCs. Okay? Uh, University of Oxford has just two edX and that's because they just joined this year. Okay? They've been holding off, holding off, holding off. Finally, they decided they could, not, um, they could not stay away, and so they just joined. They've already produced two MOOCs. Okay? But you can see, for example, Stanford has 
um, something like uh, 140 MOOCs. Uh, Cambridge is still sitting on the sidelines, but they'll come in. They'll come in. Okay. Um, MIT has produced 131, Harvard 105, uh, and all the way down. UCLA has not uh, produced this one. I'm not sure what that one is, but uh, virtually all top 25 institutions have uh, been producing quite large numbers of MOOCs. Okay? And there are wonderful MOOCs across uh, the spectrum. Okay? Science, technology, engineering to the humanities. Okay? Uh, Harvard's uh, uh, Computer Science 50 is the, the most popular computer science program in the world. It's got millions of users okay? and so forth. Yeah. So this is, uh, and University of Tokyo uh, has 10 MOOCs right now. We've got a little bit of catching up to do. Right? But what we are seeing with this is an interesting picture of um, elite institutions uh, in the 21st century. Okay? Up to now, uh, elite institutions like MIT, like Harvard, like uh, University of Tokyo, uh, have been based on the old German model. Okay? You do basic research. And then you have an educational component to it, uh, primarily to support research, but more recently, uh, you have a fuller undergraduate uh, education. Okay, so you do basic research and you educate your own students. That's the present model. Okay? And this is a model that you see uh, around the world. But looking at the MOOCs, uh, what we're seeing is a different kind of a model emerging. You still have basic research. That's not going to go away. But with that, uh, educational content provider, okay? uh, as an elite institution now, you're going to be expected to provide educational content with impact. Um, and then using that to transform campus education. Okay? So it's a, it's a loop. Okay? It makes sense, right? We are uh, here to serve society. Okay? And elite institution, institutions are expected to have impact on society. Uh, Basic research, okay, it's got to be impact uh, basic research. Okay. Before, education didn't really count in this. Okay. Although, if you think about it, there, there are cases where education has had impact. These are in form of textbooks by eminent scholars like Samuelson for economics, uh, uh, Strang for linear algebra, okay. the single scholars writing a textbook that has had tremendous impact around the world. Okay? But now, uh, along with that, you have whole institutions like MIT, like Harvard, uh, like Stanford, okay? uh, providing huge amount of content that is being used all over the world. Just like Samuelson's economic textbook okay? has impact. Okay? And so uh, it's, uh, uh, we're just looking now at just around the corner where world ranking of institutions will be based not just on basic, basic research, not just on, on campus education, but on impact to society in terms of providing uh, high quality educational content. That's coming around the corner. I mean, you can see it just by that chart that you saw. Okay. And what's equally important for this session is that this uh, exciting uh, educational content should then uh, loop back onto campus and transform on-campus education. Okay. Uh, and this is starting to happen. Uh, at MIT, we have a very large uh, Office of Digital Learning. And one component of Office of Digital Learning is to take all of those MOOCs that we produce, all of the open courseware material that we, we produce, and we're, we're uh, putting it out into the society, but at the same time, uh, we are now starting to bring it back into the classroom, to transform the classroom. Okay. And that's something that uh, I'm very much uh, part of, uh, uh, part of uh, the enterprise, uh, residential education at MIT. Okay. Uh, MOOCs transform societies in many different ways. Okay. Here's a concrete example. This is Ahan. Uh, he, uh, he, is a he was a 15-year-old young man being homeschooled, okay, studying at home in high school. And uh, he uh, told us that uh, he used MOOCs for his education. Okay. 
Um, 15 years old, he got into MIT okay, on the basis of studying with MOOCs. Okay. He is now a, a sophomore studying math. Right? Uh, we're starting to see this. And this is uh, just an example of the MOOCs that he took on his own, ho being homeschooled. Almost all uh, edX STEM courses, uh, um, except one, I guess I forgot to list it. He, oh, there it is, uh, Visualizing Japan. That was his humanities education, <laughs> okay? <laughs> right? It was a fantastic student, okay? I, I, I keep up with him. All right, so uh, I'd like to now turn to uh, our MOOC, Visualizing Japan, and I'd like to show you a little bit of uh, the MOOC itself. Okay. okay, you can get this, get to this MOOC and all edX MOOCs by going to edX, edX .org. Um, and then you can, there's edx.org, and you can register. It's free. It takes 30 seconds to register, and then you have access to whatever number, uh, uh, thousand MOOCs that edX uh, offers, and it's all free. Okay. So this is Visualizing Japan, and so let me just play you a little bit of the trailer. First, in Visualizing Japan, will follow Japan's westernization and the visual history of Commodore Perry's expedition. Next, we'll look into the first major social protest using images of the Hibi Orion. And finally, we'll examine modernity through the Shiseido Company archives. Next, in visualizing post-war Tokyo, we'll discover the way Tokyo was rebuilt and reinvented after the devastation of World War II. Finally, how is Tokyo seen today and who is looking at it? Okay. Uh, the second one is uh, visualizing post-war Tokyo by uh, Professor Yoshimi Shunya, Shunya Yoshimi of uh, University of Tokyo. So let me show you just a little bit of what this uh, visualizing Japan looks like. So uh, there are, I think, about 50 of these uh, two to six minute uh, videos, uh, followed by quizzes that are machine graded. Uh, and uh, the first time we offered this, I think we had something like uh, 3,000 students uh, actually start the course and go all the way to the end. Uh, one, when I used this to uh, teach, one thing I discovered is that students never watch video as we just did. Okay. Uh, they invariably watch video <laughs> and many <laughs> and they just use this which we, we had to put in for equal access you know uh, there's not a single student I found who listens to video at 1.0 okay and uh, it was sort of Interesting. At the end of my residential class, I invited John to come and guest, guest lecture in my class. Uh, and John was speaking, of course, at 1.0. You could sort of watch students say, where do I click on this guy and make him <laughs> go faster? Okay. So let me tell you just a little bit more uh, about visualizing Japan. Um, this is a presentation I did uh, at NHK. We were uh, finalists for the Japan Prize, which is a very prestigious prize. We did not get the final prize, but uh, uh, we were uh, given an opportunity to present uh, Visualizing Japan to a very distinguished international panel. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, as John said, Perry uh, went to Japan in 1853 and uh, we found just wonderful images. This one we found at the Chicago Historical Society, and it was very striking uh, down there. You see U.S. Uh, Japan fleet, Commodore, Commodore Perry, carrying the gospel of God to the heathen. Okay. This, is the, uh, this is Manifest Destiny. Right? And the style, if you're familiar with Manifest Destiny, is very much style of Manifest Destiny. Uh, ships going from light to dark, okay, uh, to, to save the heathens in the, the darker parts of the world. Right? Uh, but of course, uh, 
uh, Japanese didn't quite see it that way. They saw uh, demons coming, these black ships. And this is a, a wonderful uh, wood block that we found, I believe, at the Ryosenji Temple in Shimoda. And the details are quite amazing, just very striking. Okay? Um, and often, we, uh, in class, we put these two to side by side and have students talk about uh, you know, what, what does this mean? Okay? What does this mean? You have two perspectives. Okay? Uh, same ship, two perspectives. What does it mean? Okay? Uh, one of the interesting uh, comparisons is Perry. Okay? You see Perry images uh, one after another. Uh, the right side, obviously, the Japanese image, and the left side is a famous photograph by Matthew Brady. Matthew Brady is the uh, photographer who photographed President Lincoln. Okay? Uh, and he also photographed uh, Perry. Uh, if you look at uh, 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 the Japanese image, you can see that they tried their best to draw Perry, but Perry didn't come out of the ship very much. That was part of the strategy, to put distance uh, with the, the commoners. And so the artists had to guess uh, as to what Perry looked like. You know, they wanted to produce these images. They sold it. This is how they made their livelihood. And so they, uh, they got information, hearsay, about what Perry was like. And so they drew this image that looks to me like Saigo Takamori. Okay? Uh, they also heard that uh, foreigners have blue eyes. But if you look very closely, the blue is not quite in the right place. Okay? So there are all these interesting things that we find. Uh, but it is true that they try to um, draw someone who was very distinguished in the beginning. But as they found his reason for coming to Japan, the face started to change. Okay? Uh, and uh, you see this kind of Tengu uh, images as well. Uh, you see also uh, Perry's men and uh, um, the daimyo people um, dining together. Okay, finally, they, they came to some agreement. Okay. And so this is our MOOC, Massive Open Online Course. Uh, John Dower from uh, MIT, Jennifer Weisenfeld from Duke, we asked her to come in uh, for the uh, Shiseido unit, and of course, Andy Gordon uh, of Harvard. Andy, as many, many of you know, has written uh, very important textbooks about Japan. Uh, lots of discussion on uh, uh, the discussion board, lots of images. Okay, this is a Shiseido image that uh, we were able to get from uh, the Shiseido archives. Shiseido opened up their archives to us, and we have just, just amazing, stunning images on uh, visualizingcultures.com, uh, mit.edu. Uh, we had uh, people from all over the world take uh, the MOOC, literally all over the world. Okay. Um, it was, uh, age-wise, it was fairly young for a uh, uh, humanities MOOC. Okay? STEM MOOCs tend to be uh, average in the 20s. Humanities tend to uh, average in the 30s, but we had a little bit of a younger crowd. It was multinational, multigenerational, very uh, balanced by gender, uh, and uh, there are lots of different features to help uh, the learner, including this uh, Subtitle link, which turned out to be very helpful uh, for not just for people who needed this uh, be because of uh, 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 because of hearing, uh, but just regular people, um, people without uh, loss of hearing, found it useful. Okay, um, okay. and uh, actually the completion rate was quite a bit higher than the normal uh, MIT X uh, Harvard X. Uh, my role was to go to all of these places where the images are stored. This is with uh, Reverend uh, Matsui at uh, Ryosenji uh, in uh, Shimoda. Uh, he's an abbot who, uh, who runs this Buddhist uh, temple. He collects images okay. like this. He has an amazing collection of images, and uh, we use many of them. Uh, he, uh, He's, he also has a master's degree from the University of Hawaii in uh, East Asian Studies. Okay. And so he was able to explain all of this in English as well. And so what does this all mean? Okay. It transforms teaching. You have three institutions, Harvard, MIT, and Duke, okay, coming together to teach this one course. 
uh, Andy, John, and Jennifer. Yeah. Uh, we also have uh, collaboration across institutions. So uh, MIT Harvard's Visualizing Japan and the University of Tokyo's uh, Visualizing Postwar uh, Tokyo Parts 1 and 2 are now a set, okay, a series being offered by edX. Uh, and it builds on visualizing culture site that John Dower and I have been working on for the past 15 years. Visualizing culture site, uh, visualizingcultures.mit.edu has right now 52 units on Japan, China, and the Philippines. And it's used widely. Um, to do this, we need images, uh, and uh, we have uh, agreements with 200 museums around the world. And each museum has agreed to offer images to the Visualizing uh, Cultures project under Creative Commons. And these are major museums, Boston MFA, uh, Sackler Museum, Smithsonian, uh, Edo Tokyo, uh, and so forth. Uh, British uh, Museum, Hong Kong Museum, uh, Honolulu Museum of Art, major museums have agreed to uh, provide images to us under Creative Commons. And remember, Creative Commons for us means you can download it, you can distribute it, you can copy it, you can even alter it. Okay? This was important to us because uh, we wanted to offer ways for teachers to do active learning. Okay? That's what we're here for today. And one of the ways in which you do active learning is that you provide teaching materials that can be freely used, altered, distributed by teachers so that they can incorporate it and design their own teaching materials. And we wanted to do that. Okay? And this policy of Creative Commons is uh, not just for us, but across all OCW, all 2,300 courses at MIT. You can download physics simulation. You can download biology cell models, okay? all under Creative Commons. Uh, it transforms teaching. This is my residential class, and this is what we're here for today, flipping class. Um, and uh, it's just amazing uh, what this does. Okay? As I said, the most effective use of the online MOOC material is in the residential class. And this is a very deep irony, but um, lots of students uh, saw this. Okay? Uh, and uh, Ahan, again, the 15-year-old. Uh, we were able to use the Harvard uh, uh, studio, just very fancy little Hollywood, uh, in the basement of the Widener Library. Okay? Um, three cameras, um, I don't know how many uh, uh, staff they had, but uh, this way of uh, discussion turned out to be very effective. Okay? Instead of a talking head, okay? with talking heads, uh, learners tend to start listening as a radio and not as video. But when you have people interacting like this, uh, Andy, John, Jennifer, and I was in there from time to time, people, students actually watch, and they feel like they're part of um, the discussion. Um, just skip this. We, we created lots of uh, different kinds of exercises, all machine readable, uh, test, uh, gradable. Um, okay, so let me, so, Approximately 9,000 registered and 3,000 showed up on the first day, very typical. And 1,170 uh, received completion certificates. Uh, breakdown of uh, countries, uh, US, Japan, UK, Germany, China, Spain, and then you have this long, about 160 countries. We had two people from Afghanistan, uh, just, just a remarkable population. Uh, very highly educated. 60% were PhD students, 44% uh, have been teachers, uh, and 26% are participants uh, currently enrolled in a, co uh, in, in a college, okay, so forth. Okay. Um, the discussion forum was very active, positive, and constructive, and peaceful. Okay. Sometimes discussion boards can get very rowdy. Uh, you know, I got a, a hint of what this discussion board was going to be like when on the first day we put this image up. This is an image of uh, Shiseido from 1930s. Uh, this is Ginza. And we said, discuss uh, this image in terms of modernity. Okay? 
and I had no idea what was going to happen, 804 people put up very thoughtful comments. 804 people. It really surprised me. So MOOCs are not passive. They're quite active, uh, particularly in the, uh, the discussion. Um, and we did a, a residential version. And students uh, in my residential class, you saw the photographs of it. Uh, it was in the classroom that the VJX MOOC saw its greatest impact. This classroom session is much different than a typical lecture style classroom as the visualized in Japan classroom setting is instead used as a form of class discussion. That's the flipped class. Uh, this is MIT. One student uh, taking my class actually timed how much teacher was talking me, how much student was talking. And I had uh, several traditional class formats during the semester. I was talking 80%, students 20%. In the flipped class, it was 50-50. And the, the quality and the quantity of learning was like night and day. Really like night and day. Okay. Um, right. Uh, today, now let me turn to uh, uh, MIT overall. Uh, because of the huge number of MOOCs that uh, we have produced at MIT, 90% of MIT undergraduates take at least one course that is blended or flipped. Okay. Many take uh, uh, more courses in that format. Okay. So here's one example. This is uh, uh, my friend Rona Gibson, a very distinguished material scientist, okay. very, very senior. She's one of the leaders uh, of the faculty. And she teaches this mechanical behavioral materials, part one. Uh, and uh, Rona was one of very vocal uh, opponents of MOOCs when uh, we, we first started this. She didn't think that it was a good idea okay, to turn lectures into videos. But now she is one of the strongest proponents of MOOCs. And uh, uh, I just saw her give a presentation last week. Uh, last week there was a what's called festival of learning at MIT. All day long, these uh, professors came in and talked about uh, their uh, uh, experience of flipping class. I asked Lorna uh, to uh, give me a quote, and this is uh, what she just sent uh, yesterday. Uh, flipping the class in mechanical behavior of materials has allowed the students to focus more deeply on each week's topic. Most importantly, they touch the material several times during the week, watching the online lectures, one, doing the online problems, two, with instantaneous feedback, doing the more challenging short written problem sets, attending tutorials, and answering the weekly mini quizzes. Students develop their understanding on one topic before moving on to the next. Okay. Uh, students love the flexibility of the flipped class and the immediate feedback on assignments. As one student put it, the class <laughs> made me happy and confident. This is the ultimate goal for our uh, classes. Okay. Uh, this is another uh, course taught by a very distinguished economist, two economists. Esther Duflo and uh, uh, Banerjee. This is a class uh, in the economics uh, department that uh, looks at how effective um, funding to underdeveloped countries is. Okay. It's been a huge um, uh, enterprise. And uh, Esther has won a prize in economics that's supposed to be a precursor to the Nobel, Nobel Prize. Okay. We're all hoping. She'll be the first woman uh, if that happens uh, for uh, economics uh, Nobel Prize. So for uh, that class, um, okay, uh, flipping the classroom. This is that economics class. Um, Uh, in particular, during the first half of class, students are grouped into teams. They prepare a presentation together on a weekly case study. Uh, for example, ways of alleviating poverty through health-based interventions. Um, and then in the latter half of class, one group is randomly chosen to do the presentation. You know, there's not enough time for all uh, groups to do 
uh, presentation, but they are randomly picked. So you, you don't know whether you're going to be picked or not. So you work very hard in the first half to uh, uh, cre create your own uh, presentation. There's a uh, website for ODL, Office of Digital Learning, uh, which has uh, many of these stories about uh, uh, active classroom learning, flip class. Okay. And it, it's visualizing Japan. Here's, uh, here's one of the bread and butter courses at MIT, uh, 602. It's a computer science course. And there's an article about uh, the experience of flipped in class. Um, the blue line indicates uh, the grade after the class was flipped, and uh, uh, the red and the other lines before flipping the class. And according to this article, flipped in the class improved the midterm, first midterm exam grade by about 10%. Ten percent. That's uh, that's quite a significant uh, uh, improvement. There are other uh, stories here if you're interested in reading about it. Okay. So flipped in class. This is uh, uh, this is uh, um, you know uh, we used to say that if if you bring bring back Newton, okay, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, to this day, you take him to uh, a research lab, he wouldn't know what's going on with all this new mechanical, new, um, new equipment. But then if you take him to a classroom, he'll say, oh, I can do this. You know, uh, it hasn't changed too much. The flipped class format is uh, uh, an exception. Sir, Sir Isaac Newton didn't flip class. Okay? Uh, but uh, doing so, you can see, has tremendous, tremendous advantages. And uh, one of the interests that I have, now that I know how valuable flipping class is, is to try to find applications where faculty can create videos very quickly, very easily, very inexpensively, and put it up so that students can uh, watch the video prior to coming to class. And in class, you flip uh, classroom. Lots of experiments going on. We are doing several uh, at MIT. Uh, one thing that we're doing here, and there'll be um, a little bit of uh, discussion of it, is uh, something that uh, has been developed by Cyber University. The president of Cyber University, Hiroshi Kawahara, is here. Uh, CC Producer is an application that uh, uses your, um, the webcam, and you can create video on the run and combine it with PowerPoint and, uh, uh, and then upload it onto cloud. And your students will be able to see that. Okay. Lots of experiments going on now with CC Producer at the uh, University of Tokyo and other institutions around Japan. Okay. Uh, and finally, Visualizing Japan, uh, the MIT version is being taught right now at the University of Tokyo. This is uh, Professor uh, Kumiko Morimura, an engineering professor. Uh, she is teaching Visualizing Japan at uh, uh, University of Tokyo with about uh, seven students, uh, three Todai students, two MIT students, one uh, uh, PhD student in history from uh, Peking University. Okay. They are right now, in fact, in uh, Shimoda this weekend. Okay. That's something you get to do when you teach a course about Japan in Japan. <laughs> you can actually, you know, and they're, they're visiting uh, Shiseido uh, this uh, coming Friday. Okay. Very exciting, and it's flipped. It's flipped. Okay. Professor Morimura uh, has done flipped class for the first time in her life, and she is very excited about uh, about the experience. Okay. And she's also using a CC producer. Her students will be creating stories okay, about their experience using a CC producer. Okay. So that's uh, that's my story. And I'm going to end it here. Uh, I think there's a little bit of time for a question and answer. So thank you so much.